To simply exist as a woman and endure the toxic masculinity in the modern West is essentially a superpower, or at least training to have superpowers. If you disagree, then you are clearly a toxic male fanboy that has been successfully triggered by the brilliantly totes not sexist writers and creatives hired to create the show for women by women with his She-Hulk attorney at law. And I'm just whatever a man is though, so I only say this off of what some of the aforementioned oppressed Western women have told me is the Western women's experience. And I'm also not going to go much into like the film crew and the people who are involved with actually making it, like behind the scenes, the grips, the camera people and like that, because uh, that's still mostly male, because unlike She-Hulk in the show, in that Marvel universe, there's no super strength yet for women and we're sexually dimorphic species that still exists. So there's probably some union laws about also hiring based off of happenstances of birth and things like that. But anyway, <laughs> back to the point here. Y'all have probably seen this um, scene. It's going to be an image on the screen. You can check it out now from She-Hulk, Attorney at Law. When Tatiana Masley, I want to say Tatiana Masley, Mas Maslany, Tatiana Maslany, as Jennifer Walters says this to Bruce Banner, played by Mark Ruffalo, and Mark Ruffalo is like all like Hulk Todd Farm and things like that, and Hulk, you know, Hulk Smash and things like that. He used to have issues with her rage, but he's been training her to deal with her Hulk powers, and it turns out that, oh, she can just control the Hulk powers. She can turn into She-Hulk and still just be regular in control of her mind and go back down, and Hulk's kind of wondering, like, oh, what's happening with this? So this is the line that Tatiana says. It's a kind of a cool scene. It's a little tiny Tatiana, and then like, or a little tiny Jennifer Walters played by Tatiana in like the massive... Uh, Bruce Banner Hulk type of version. Okay, so that's what she says. Here's the thing, Bruce. I'm great at controlling my anger. I do it all the time. When I'm catcalled in the street, when incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me, I do it pretty much every day because if I don't, I'll get called emotional or difficult or might just get murdered. So I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. As you can expect, this got a reaction from some people. And I get that it's a television show. It's television shows. You can't really call them a television show anymore now with the streaming because a lot of these people watch things on computers or other ways. I get it's a show. It's entertainment. Just some lines written to be said by someone pretending to be someone else in some other situation. But that aside, are you or do you know any women who really think men generally have no emotions? or they don't control the emotions that they have, or they walk around not concerned for physical safety even though they're the majority target of physical violence. I'm thinking this really can't apply. This mindset, this thought, this opinion of men can't really be more than what maybe less than 1% of the world thinks. A strong and independent woman I know recently asked why it seems that the women, like the example she provided, that was raging about patriarchy, all too often have men in their lives that support and help them. Outside of the performative nature of political signaling, Let's say this particular woman actually believed that she was in general more harmed by patriarchy at large than she was aided by the men in her personal life. Now I'm trying to empathize, to think about where you would stand on this, because this woman she was talking about is not some ignoramus. She's aware of her own lived experience to a certain extent, whether she says it or not. She's actually lived it, so she knows men in her life are helping her. So maybe this certain sort of woman could think that the men who help them might be doing it in a seemingly effortless way, and they resentfully acknowledge that they have been helped and actually ahead of other women in the world that might not have the help. So there's an aspect of feeling guilty for benefiting off of the patriarchy over the rest of the sisterhood. So she's thinking like, if it wasn't for patriarchy, then I wouldn't need that help. I'd be like men, or I wouldn't, or none of the other women would need that help. I'd be just like the men that don't need help from men, and instead, she would actually be in the position to help other people, including the sisterhood. Now back to the analysis of Jennifer Walters' character, explaining why she can hulk out and maintain control to Bruce Banner's Hulk, or maybe She-Hulk, Hulk explaining hulking out to the Hulk. I shall begin with this excerpt from an article on Looper that was titled, the She-Hulk episode 1 scene that was really special to Tatiana Maslany. After explaining the scene and giving the quote from the image before, they say this. Maslany further explained to Decider that the scene was one of the moments in the show that I'm like, this is so special to see this in this larger superhero story. So much of this allegory of superheroes is always rooted in these smaller human moments, and so to get to really speak to that was very cool. 
and then goes on to discuss a bit more about the source material of this, the comic book. Unlike a lot of problems that arise while making a Marvel show, Gao, and Gao is the head writer, couldn't really look to She-Hulk's 40 plus years of comic book lore for an answer. All the way back to the character's debut in 1979 Savage She-Hulk number one, Jen retains her consciousness and personality during her first transformation into She-Hulk. Now, I write on the blog, writeathon.wordpress.com. You can check it out. Links will be somewhere when you listen to this. And I'm thinking there might be a typo here. I think they meant could look to She-Hulk's 40 plus history because keeping her mind in control, that is kind of canon. But before going into more about this, I think this is an example of how some will say, don't complain about X because it was like X in the source material. Then go on to say, don't say it should be like Y because this isn't the same thing as the source material. When you release some art to the public, in my estimation, it is no longer the possession of the artist, the creator, especially if that artist or creator sells off any rights they may have to that work. And anyone should be free to critique anything, but I do not expect anyone owes me any sort of art in the way that I want that art to be. I'm just glad if somebody creates something that is appealing to me or something that fits, that happens to make a chance. And the tactic of basing art on previous work, though, and then saying that you'll do it like it was done in that previous work, like it was done before, and then you do it in your own way, that kind of irks me. Not She-Hulk waking up from a comatose state, punching random doctors mad, though, like in the image from her origin that's <laughs> somewhere links below. You can also find it on the blog. Probably also on the screen if you're watching like the video version. It's just a couple of panels. She comes out, she's in hospital. You get the doctors dressed in white in those <laughs> 60s or old school, 1970s, 80s kind of <laughs> comic book poses where always in midst of action and some kind of flares in the pants. But she's kind of punching people, just going down with her ripped clothes. This is after she comes out from the hospital. So why not borrow more from the comics? And now here is another excerpt from Looper in a different article called What Only Comics Readers Know About She-Hulk's MCU Origin story. On the run from the law, Bruce reconnects with Jennifer who is preparing a case against local crime boss Nick Trask. The gangster's goons critically injure Jennifer in a drive-by shooting and Bruce administers an impromptu blood transfusion. But Bruce's gamma-radiated blood doesn't just save Jennifer's life. It also transforms her into She-Hulk whenever she gets angry. As She-Hulk, Jennifer shares some powers with Bruce, including super strength and a giant green appearance, though She-Hulk luckily retains her intelligence and personality when she transforms. So what's this here? In the comic books, Bruce saves her life? Oh no, 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 no. Not this damsel. But I guess this is what they're saying with their argument, where if you've watched the show or seen the reviews of it, this was at the end or part of a montage where Bruce was trying to get the change to happen by making her surprised or making her angry and then just shows that she can actually just turn it on and off. So I think, I think that's, that's the main difference that's happening here in the show that's not there from the comic book. So they wanted some kind of explanation of why she's not just triggered by the anger itself. But it makes sense that getting whatever helps somebody hulk out in the form of blood from a being, hulk being, that already has that thing in control, that hulking out system in control via a transfusion, rather than whatever a full body gamma ray bombardment does to change the body from scratch to convert the blood into hulk blood to begin with. The result was somebody being more sane and having more control over this thing. I don't think you <laughs> need to go to leaps and bounds to realize that there's a difference to that. And Banner himself has been doing a lot of tests on his blood over a long amount of time. You could just have an explanation where oh, this is something that we know. He's <laughs> been studied by people who are scientists and know more things about him. He's had aliens and other kind of things involved. So there's just a lot of reasons why getting Hulk's blood could be different than getting an actual gamma ray bomb on your face. So <laughs> think about it something like getting a pre-pandemic change of definition of what a vaccine is versus falling into a vat full of just pure virus. Your body's going to react to that element in a different way. As for the person's mental state prior to the ability to hulk out being a contributing factor to the anger, was it simply just not being a Western woman that handicapped Bruce Banner? I don't think so, and as I said, I think less than 1% of the world would actually think something like that. Toxic masculinity definitely does exist, as any sort of behavior can have expressions on the fringes of that behavior that are generally harmful to the actor, the person acting those things out, and of course those around them that are subjected to the actions of this person that is infected with this thing. Let's say infected, because it is some sort of infection of not a normal thing. Like, we're calling it toxic, not because that's its general state of it. Masculinity is just masculinity in there, then when you add toxic, that is a modifier to define what the normal thing is. Like, there's no need to say toxic rat poison, because you already know rat poison itself is inherently toxic. 
Now, although we don't know as much about, at least I don't know as much about Bruce Banner's MCU's childhood, like Marvel Cinematic Universe's childhood, in the comic books, it's canon across all the depictions that I've seen that he was rather severely abused as a child, both physically and mentally. And again, we're talking about back in the day type of stuff. So even for back then, pre like peaceful parenting being like a common type of thing, he was <laughs> really abused. As you can see on this image of him just being backhanded or show. I recall some storylines as well that mentioned that he had sought some forms of therapy and he was into like self-knowledge and things like this. He was working on himself even before the pre-gamma irradiated life that he lived as the Hulk. But when the Hulk ego says something like puny banner as a thing, when he uses it, he's not using it as a term of endearment comparing their size. Like, oh, you're so small. Banner so small and cute. No, the puny banner thing, that Hulk persona was a separate character that had an antagonistic relationship to Bruce playing towards the insecurities that Bruce Banner himself had as a short, small kind of man. And this Hulk persona itself was in part a vehicle for and fueled by the anger that he himself had bottled up for so long as this puny Banner type of nerdy character that was limited by society due to his small stature and was also subjected to some of the challenges that short, weak men have in society. The Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde duality offers some opportunities for storytelling that go away if Bruce Banner was just the Hulk and the Hulk was just Bruce Banner. Now maybe in MCU that doesn't necessarily match the Mark Ruffalo and Bruce Banner, but this is something that was relatively clear in the comic books, which again is something that appeals. You can see the Tatiana, she's like a tiny person. So that's something that I, I think it would kind of be interesting to see that if Tatiana had actually like related to Bruce and like, Bruce, you as a small man should realize some of the challenges being a smaller female would be like in society, but no, it's just that kind of thing. And that's an angle that I could have taken, I thought would have been appreciated and still gotten across the same kind of challenges. Like, hey, if you can relate to a small man going through this, maybe you can go the further step and relate to the fact that smaller women even go through this at a more significant physicality gap. And possibly a good place this could have actually been dropped, mentioned before, or led to, and then you could refer it back to in this conversation here, or you could have just cut back this. I don't know. You can have that thing. Like, you remember that part in the show as well? After Jennifer has hulked out after the car accident and the blood gets transfused into her body and she kind of hulks out and runs away, yes, she does kind of abandon Bruce Banner in the car right there, doesn't know after that alien spaceship. Maybe the alien spaceship took her, I don't know, I'm just going to run off into the woods. Now, I think if I remember this correctly, she blacked out on that first transformation and then has been okay since then. But she ends up being outside a bar somewhere and she almost punches some cat collars and more on this later as an expression of how the Hulk power can let out her anger that she didn't have. Previously, in other situations, she might have just had to seethe on this, and Banner's Hulk comes in and prevents the assault by just jumping off with the She-Hulk. Which, actually, in <laughs> this scene, is <laughs> I saw this, this one article, <laughs> this one article kind of talking about how there are no, like, Latin actors in... <laughs> There's no Latinos in the show yet. And it's a show set in Los Angeles, which is like 48% Latin or people. And so there's no Latin people in the show yet. And somebody posted, it was like, oh, there's no Latin men even in that Mexico scene. But then I think if these men had clearly been Latin locals and catcalling in Spanish, hey, senorita, doing things like that, I bet some people would also complain that it's a negative trope of Latin men being losarios and things like this. But anyway, this is not necessarily the damsel in distress trope where, oh, the big Hulk needs to come and save him from these men. But rather, it was the Hulk was saving the toxic men from the distress that this damsel was about to put them in. So I think this could have been a cool callback and Hulk could have been like, what were you doing? You're about to like beat up these men with like this superpower that you have. And then she could have kind of expressed like, well, this is the anger. This is the thing that I've felt for all this time. They could have had a bonding moment. Because Hulk could also be like, yeah, I remember being in certain location, then this happened to me as well. I mean, it, it, could, it could be a thing. It could be a bonding moment. But, but no. That's not the sort of empowerment that some may think of. But let's go back to that Hulk explaining scene from the start and see what else Tatiana Maslany has to say about this from the Decider article. Tatiana Maslany praises She-Hulk attorney at Law Virtual Effects team. I felt so empowered. I mean, to me, that scene is one of the easiest scenes I've ever gotten to play because the truth of what she's saying is so resonant to me. Head writer Jessica Gao wrote that scene obviously from an experienced place, a deep place, and she did it with so much humor and such a light touch. 
it really is just speaking the truth that I think so many of us have experienced. This is a subjective experience. There is a time Jessica Gao, Tatiana Maslany, and many other women out there. To me, many just means 25% and more, 25% plus one is what qualifies as many to me. So I can truly imagine that that many women have actually felt an experience that they were put upon when, hey, oh, wow, you're a woman and you're doing this. And like, no, no, I should be able to do this. I've had all this experience. This person doesn't. But like it or not, being a woman is just one of the many things people assign certain expectations to. But if somebody is saying that you have experience as a female that defines how you see the world, and then you claim that you need female writers to tell things from a female point of view for females acted out by females, then is this resulting line, this resulting scene, this resulting show something that only females can understand? Or do they claim that anyone can learn from females explaining the female experience in a show so now in the future they don't have to be female to be hired to write a different show about females from a female point of view since they would have already learned it from watching a show like She-Hulk Attorney at Law? Now, I would be far from anything that somebody would consider a purist when it comes to Marvel and everything. I already mentioned my take on art. I create art myself. Once I put it out there, do whatever you want with it. And that's actually part of the project that I'm working on with a few friends. Get a system where it's like cloud storytelling. When I tell the story, it's yours to tell. Once I put it out there, you can do whatever with it, as long as I'm able to do what I'm doing with it. So I have no issue with things changing. But Hulk, when I was reading the comic books, when I was reading Marvel, was one of the characters that did appeal to me. And I think his inability to control the anger, his own anger, and the ramifications of angering the wrong person, like you might see this small Bruce Banner and then do something to piss him off, and then all of a sudden he hawks out and something happens to you. So that kind of thing, oh, know who you're dealing with. Then another thing was overcoming the base tendency to you won't use one's own power to actually just get something done that you want done and just force it on someone. I myself, as a relatively stronger person, I always used to consider like, oh, am I using too much strength in this thing? Am I worried about hurting? So there's some aspect in that, and that made this character more intriguing to me. Now with this show, it's titled She-Hulk Attorney at Law, which is <laughs> at least accurately indicates that this is less about being a Hulk. It's about attorney at law. It's about being a lawyer. And the problem with this now is that this is an admission by the head writer and the other writers themselves that they do not think that they are good at writing courtroom and other related law content, other drama type of content, which somebody could consider might be an issue if you are writing something about law, <laughs> not a lawyer, and you're putting the primary focus on this. And in this Decider article, She-Hulk Attorney at Law cast and crew explains how the series updates She-Hulk's powers, shows how the powers of the Hulk are secondary to the Hulk being a woman. The woman, Jennifer Walters, the lawyer, that's the main focus of this. Keep that in mind when you're watching the show, when you're reviewing the show, that's what I keep in mind. I try to think, what is the creator trying to actually put out? And I judge it from that point of view, but as I mentioned, you can still critique other things that are presented or are not there. <laughs> it's a free world. The art is out there. Okay. A writer's room was very, very heavily female, She-Hulk head writer Jessica Gower told the cider. When the representation behind the camera matches the representation in front of the camera, you get a lot more nuance because we're mining each other's life experiences. Everybody has different perspectives on their experience as a woman, so we start talking about a lot of these things. A lot of common themes and patterns and issues start emerging. Now, again, as, as I mentioned before, I'm not going to get into this much. But she's talking about behind the camera. She's talking about behind, she's talking about behind the camera in the air-conditioned writer's room and things like that. Not behind the camera, literally carrying the camera and the heavy things and moving the things in the stage and all those things. That right there is still predominantly men. But then again, they're just tools. They're just tools being told where to go by the directors and the producer. So yeah, they're, they're just the hands and the machines that the, the women who are actually behind the camera. Hmm. Now, with this show relying heavily on computer-generated imagery, I wonder if the people quitting due to the heavy workload were also women. But then again, you have this whole thing of the experience, more lived experience type of thing. If being X is a prerequisite to know what X is like, then how does Jennifer know what not having lived with what she claims is the normal female experience is like? to give this tirade or this line or this powerful, special thing to Bruce. How are the female writers and character of Jennifer aware of what the male lived experience is? I doubt that most people writing articles or in She-Hulk's writer's room can truly think that acting out in anger is a positive thing. If men are actually more prone to lose themselves to emotion, it is not a perk, but rather a handicap 
such as the often maligned trope of saying women are prone to hysterics. More from the article. It's not easy being the Hulk. Sure, you get super strength and invulnerability, but you also lose your mind literally. For over a decade's worth of movies, Bruce Banner ceded control of his hulked out body to a massive Luke Scannon who left death and destruction in his wake. Being the Hulk has some perks, but it's not like you get to actually enjoy those perks. That's not the case with She-Hulk, the latest superhero to make the leap from the printed page to the live-action Marvel Cinematic Universe. Whereas Banner had to work incredibly hard for an incredibly long time in order to merge his mind with his Incredible Hulk form, his cousin Jennifer just becomes She-Hulk, and neither one becomes an unstoppable engine of devastation in the process. The question is, how? And I think this is again why they said, okay, the how has to be a bit different than it is in the comic book, because in the comic book it's a blood transfusion type of thing. I don't know if they actually go into why the blood transfusion is different than a gamma bomb in the actual comic book. But here they seem to say the hard work had already been done. Jennifer had already done the work. You know, you have to do that work. The work had already been done existing as a Western woman and dealing with all the things that the character Jennifer Waters, the actress Tatiana Maslany that's actually de depicting this character, the writer Jennifer Gower that was writing this special type of thing, the women in behind the camera in the writer's room and all these type of things, that's just that's just default, as I said, that's, that's their superpower. Having emotional control. Being a Western woman is like a vaccine to being a Hulk. But in general, control over emotions is something people just accept from well-adjusted functional adults, which is of course indicative of the supporters of the show. Now check out some of the comments from the original image that was posted on Facebook. It's a link again <laughs> below if you ever get into the blog and go read through and see other things yourself. I got a couple of excerpts here going to be on the screen. So Tabitha Ann says, I was clapping at that part. It's so true. I don't get to yell and scream at people as much as I would love to. I'm a woman. I've... <laughs> What is this? I'm a woman. I've had men threaten violence for speaking up before. Not fun. Also love that Bruce didn't tell her no or gaslight her. Love the acknowledgement. My daughter and I actually love this show. So what 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 is what is a woman anyway? And do they confirm that these people they were talking about were not self-identified as women? Now I think yelling and screaming, that's something that children kind of do, and maybe people think children best time of your life was when you were a kid. No, I like adult life with more control and more agency and things like that. But maybe some people appeal to that and they think that's a perk. A perk of being a child is being so frustrated and being able to just yell and scream and not talk things out, think things out, reason things out. Because above when just talking about in that quote saying it's a perk of being the Hulk, you can't actually enjoy those perks. Is a perk just super strength and healing and the ability to hear from far and fall from like a <laughs> plane and not die? Those are kind of default perks that you can experience as a Hulk. If Tabitha Ann can realize that people threatening violence against her is not fun, then why would she consider it to be positive, somehow desirable, if she could yell and scream at people more than she actually does? Or is it because she's just thinking, well, as a woman, doesn't come with the same implied violence that a man's does? Because she might not really acknowledge or accept the fact that with women, it's more proxy violence. They threaten and scream, and then somebody else, usually a man, comes and carries out the violence that is behind that threat and scream of the woman. Next one, Addie friends. She says, What's sad is that men will never understand. They'll never understand because they won't ever live the life of a woman growing up and having this constant prejudice against us. Okay, again, see, as an XX, you XY can never understand what it is like to be an XX because you have never lived as an XX, but as an XX that has only been an XX, I can understand what you, an XY, can never understand and all the reasons why you as an XY treat XX like you do. Once you notice this whole double standard of saying, as a lived experience, I'm the only one who can see this, but since you're not this lived experience, you can't see this, but yet I'm not your lived experience, I can still see your lived experience. Once you see this thing, you will notice it over and over again. It happens a lot. It's everywhere. You'll keep seeing it. Also again, what is a woman? Did France in this situation also grow up to be a biologist know that none of the men objecting to this claim of constant prejudice have also been women at some time in their life? I don't know. Next one. Shannon Findlay says, Look at all the men in this thread laughing at women because they can't get one. So sad. Ah, yes. 
The good old stop you women like they can't be more than sex objects, but I'm going to mock you for not having had access to women as sex objects. I get that it's like one may not care about X sport, but then say that fans of Y team and X sport are just complaining about Z team because Y team lost to Z, but they should instead just be happy for the good things happening to Z, which is more than just X's most recent opponent. But in general this you can't get a woman to grant you sexual access mockery is a trite thing to say that is often an admission of how important the woman's value as a sex object is to the person saying it, and also acknowledging that, especially in the western world, with the sexually dimorphic species that we have, that we are mammals, that this is something that you can see in the animal kingdom that has actually been enshrined and built up in the social construct, that in general it is the female of the species who tend to control when sex actually happens, and especially having this sex come to fruition in the primary aim of what sex is made for, which is reproduction of genes and to a slightly lesser extent, the species. I think there's a part here that also indicates that there's something lacking from the people who say this about the knowledge of what men tend to actually like. In the majority of the cases, men are only partially attracted to sexuality. To the sexual aspect. It is part of the sexual market values, the sexuality, if it's a sexual relationship you're looking for, but there's more about that. It's more about what the sexuality of a woman represents in their ability to reproduce, nurture children, and provide companionship in a shared home. This is true for females too. They find men sexually desirable due to things that signal reproductive fitness, the ability to provide resources to nurture potential children, and secure a potential home. For example, do folk like Findlay truly think that the higher rates of male depression post-divorce are due to the man no longer having access to sex from this particular woman that they're divorced from? Or do they understand that most men, even those in this thread that are discussing that she's mocking here, value women for more than sex? Because technically after divorce, you can go get other women, right? Oh yeah, sure, you might have given half your money away, so you might not be as attractive to other women that you are attracted to because you're not making as much money and things like that. So there could be something like that. Single mothers kind of <laughs> look at single fathers in the same way that like obese women look at obese men. Like, no, nah, I want nothing to do with them. I want them single, fit, <laughs> unencumbered men making a lot of money type. But anybody that can just do the simple research, we know that male suicide rates are much higher than female. And the attempts, when you look at the actual attempts, that might be closer. But it's a general trope that men refuse to cry or need to talk more about their feelings. We are humans, and outside of psychopaths, we all have emotions and deal with them differently. I think it's good to see this continued focus on what some women have to deal with, these struggles that they actually have to deal with living life. Yes, you're in the West. Yes, you're in the top 1% of the 1% of human life and condition, but you still compare your condition to the people around you and you don't have to just look in the past and say, oh, people never actually had food, so it's okay that I'm starving. No, I get that there's actually issues that you still have, but I don't necessarily think this has to be done in the sort of way that, unlike men, we have to X, Y, Z. There's a way you can point out, if you, especially if you're trying to appeal to somebody, you can say, like you, I also have to X, Y, Z. Or you can just come out and say, I have to X, Y, Z, without having to compare it to this other person, this other being, and make this... It seems to be unnecessarily antagonistic when you put it this way, but I guess if you have the mentality that it's a patriarchy, this might be what you feel needs to happen to speak truth to that power, even though in my estimation we are a gynocentric society that focuses more on the actual well-being of females which makes sense with them being the deciding factor to reproduction. Civilization is simply a social construct to serve our biology, and if you don't somehow prioritize female safety and protection, your society will eventually collapse. But maybe their inability to write courtroom content is a symptom of their personal struggles of going about how somebody or people may be guilty or innocent of certain accusations, and what an ethical punishment for what they're guilty of should be. And again, this goes back to the whole like threats for the women who might not see themselves as agents of violence and things like this, proxy violence type of thing. If the writers had taken the time to maybe research more about the judicial system in the United States of America and the courts and things like this, and I think, I'm assuming, I think it's safe to assume that they would be the sort who would agree with saying that the country is white supremacist, and one of the ways you can tell that is a judicial system that preferences, gives preferential treatment to white people. An example, they would take X crime and say, white men who commit X crime get two years on average less than criminals of color who commit the same crime. If you look at that and you say that's an example of white supremacy, look at the stats of X crime when you compare men to women. 
it's normally something like women get half the amount of time. If it's a 10 years kind of sentence, you say, okay, white men are getting eight years, black men are getting 10 years. If you look at women, look at white women for the same crime, you might find the white women are getting something like four or five years, something like that, compared to the black men getting that. So in that situation, would you say it's a matriarchy? It's a white female matriarchy? I don't think most people would say that. I think sensibly you'd look at it and say, are white women, are these white women have the same kind of history, arrest history as these black men that are doing it in that situation? Are they more prone to actually committing this violence? What is the recidivism of these people? How often do they actually repeat, offend these kind of crimes? Those are things that you'd actually have to consider. What's the actual damage and effect of them committing this crime on the actual people they were actually accused of committing this crime to? These are the considerations I think most people would kind of think of. They would accurately say that, hey, that's not indicative of women. Not all women are like these criminals, just like they would say not all black people are like these criminals. But there is this tendency to judge men by their worst examples and women by their best examples. And the statement of not all X are like that is the thing that comes to mind here. And I'll close off with some excerpts from a recent Forbes article titled, She-Hulk is a direct, unapologetic attack on toxic Marvel fanboys. She-Hulk was apparently conceived correctly predicting its own backlash by a familiar group of toxic male fanboys who exist in the comic book movie show space. Wait, something about the author. There's an audiobook I just started called The Exodus that happens to be actually written by the same author of this article. I think, I don't know if this art, this guy is actually mean to this. I mean, this might be some trolling type of articles or he's just doing some kind of... <laughs> commentary type of thing, but Paul Tassi is the one who wrote this article. He's the writer for Forbes and the book, The Exodus. I think I'm about a quarter of the way in. It's, it's pretty good so far. Go check it out if you have it. Okay, back to the article. While the show has had explicitly pro-feminist messaging from the first episode as Jen juggles the double standards for female superheroes, in episode 3, She-Hulk just goes directly at these kinds of toxic fans with an entire montage focused on a bunch of dudes saying she's too derivative, derivative, <laughs> we can't say this word right now, derivative of an emasculated Hulk or debating whether or not she was bangable. Yeah, you, you see you see kind of why I'm trolling here because this is this is a typical thing that happens to all heroes. This is a general thing. Even in the show itself in season one, Jennifer becomes She-Hulk after she was in the car with Bruce Banner talking about Captain America. Steve Rogers is in that universe's virginity and them having a car crash. She then finds her way to her bathroom at a random bar to have people enter this bar and make her up to boost her attractiveness, talk her up, say, yes, yes, you're okay, like we'll forget this man, like whatever, you'll be okay, you'll be okay. And then, yes, in episode three, there is that part with the tweets and the things like that and the commentary and all that kind of thing. But there is also the twerking. She-Hulk, Jennifer Waters, twerks in the office, glass kind of doors, supposed to be professional type of thing with Megan the Stallion. Megan the Stallion, this is somebody known for that WAP, wet ass, gushy, gushy <laughs> type of video. That's one of her things to fame. Is out there. That... This is totes not about sexuality. Remember, boys and girls, if you sexualize a woman in front of a bar that's dressed in a certain attention-grabbing way, it is grounds for her super-powered self to punch you, to harm you, to hurt you. But her gyrating her rear end is totes not sexualized. Avert your male gaze. These women are just clapping them booty cheeks as applause for how empowered they are. When they engage in the variation that drops down their glutamus maxinimus low to the floor... They are not actually simulating sexual intercourse, but rather displaying their squat form and encouraging health at every size. Now, some out there might be surprised about this and saying this is a mixed message. Then Paul Tassi and the show writers say this is pro-feminist. But what is this twerking? How does this fit in? But it's actually closer to what feminism actually is in practice. There is the don't sexualize cohort right along with the we will protest internationally while wearing genitalia representations as hats on even the little children that we take along in this protest. Then you also have the we are so sex positive that we support drag queens, which are essentially men doing an overly stylized caricature of mostly sexual femininity as ambassadors of how it is to be a woman in the West. So I do agree, this show does stick to what feminism is about. This is a pro-feminist message show. This is the type of thing that I would expect from people with that intention. And you also need to stop treating the show like it's supposed to be a typical Marvel action production 
to move merchandise and the general story of the Marvel Cinematic Universe extended universe forward. I see it as an attempt to attract new demographics of middle-aged women to the Marvel Cinematic Universe and possibly do some background benefits of having content made for women, starring women for women, which can be thrown in as a whole for the Disney kind of company and say, okay, yes, we are meeting the ESG goals. Everything else that comes from the show, I think, is a bonus. More from the Forbes article. At some point, the women involved in universes like the MCU were going to get the green lights to push back. Previously, this mainly happened off-camera where actresses like Brie Larson, who plays Captain Marvel, had fanboys declare war on her after comments she made about how too many movie credits was, was, was that like some, what was the, the, the flub type of thing where you, something you're thinking, of, maybe I was going to say Cratons, Cratons, too many movie critics, critics, critics. It's actually critics. Do you know somebody who says critics or is this just like a silent T type of situation? Okay, back to this. Too many movie critics <laughs> are white men, and she wanted more women and people of color in her own junkets. That sparked a, parentheses, very stupid firestorm that caused Captain Marvel to be review bombed so hard that Rotten Tomatoes had to change its policies about user-submitted user scores. So I meant to believe that Brie Larson, who I assume identifies as a white person, is also an internationally famous actress and she was being paid millions by a billion dollar company that's ran mostly by white men, pointed out that they think folk should be hired based on race and sex to talk about the project that she was a part of, and had a platform to say what she said, and then have the mainstream media signal boost that message, and have Rotten Tomatoes, which is one of the biggest sources for the sort of thing that she was critiquing, change the actual rules of their website to better fit Brie Larson's desires, and that's, is, is this the white privilege I've been told about? No, silly Silas, white women are the most afflicted in these times of misogyny. If it wasn't for the review bombers, everyone would have loved the movie just as much as the first Iron Man, and there's also no thing at all, no thing at all like review fluffing. When you look at the examples of Captain Marvel, Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power, She-Hulk Attorney at Law, all things that have been told is representation, it's strong women leads and things like this. When Captain Marvel has, on imdb.com, Internet Movie Database, has 9.4% of 10, perfect 10 ratings, that is not review fluffing. But the, the 6% of one ratings, that's technically, that's review bombing. These people are not actually talking about the actual content. When you look at Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, it has 31.9% at a perfect 10. That's not review fluffing. But the 24.4%, uh, yeah, those people right there, that's review bombing. When you look at She-Hulk Attorney at Law, when you have 19.4% perfect 10, that's not review fluffing. When you have the 1%, uh, the people who are giving the 1 at 38.1%, that is toxic fanboy review bombing. No one at all would go and post perfect ratings for things outside of the quality of the show. Who actually believes something like this? I, I don't think that many people. I don't pay too much attention to these sort of movie review sites, but there are certain things that you'll see a difference between the user ratings and the critic ratings. There are professional people who are set to review these things. And some people talk about this access media who understand if I give a bad rating to a certain thing, I might not get the perks getting the movie early or getting the game early, getting special access and invited to actually review these type of things. It's a job. People have different interests in what they're doing, whereas users will just do the thing. But if you actually go to check out the user thing, some suggestions if you actually are going to use these sites, ignore the top scores, ignore the lower scores, and see what happens in the middle there. And if there is an opportunity for somebody to actually put some text to explain the actual scores that they're giving to whatever it is that they're rating, if somebody doesn't give an actual explanation, discount the actual review score that they gave. I don't think it would make much sense to make an entire show, especially millions of dollars, I think it's like 20 million per episode or something like that, that just generally targets toxic male fanboys. But is it possible, is there some type of show that would target a subset of women that are infected with toxic femininity? Or in this case, it's a not all women are like that, meets an attack on one is an attack on all women. So if you actually do this, you're just scared of strong, independent women if you actually decided to say this about a particular show. I, I don't know if that actually... Hmm. 
wait, there actually are some movies like that. Was it Gone Girl or something like that, where they actually had a woman in a certain role? I think there was actually a recent thing that I heard of somebody complaining that in some reviews of some show that the main female lead on it was just so dislikable that they wanted a trigger warning of how dislikable this woman was, when some women are really dislikable. Okay, so <laughs> last excerpt. Fortunately for She-Hulk, it has Tatiana Maslany as its star, who really can do no wrong, and she's what's holding this entire thing together, as only she can. I do hope She-Hulk can move beyond its haters eventually and become something fully compelling by the end, even if it shreds the traditional Marvel formula, which at this point is something of a welcome relief. And I kind of agree that it's good to see a different take on this, see a different point of view on this Marvel Universe, approach it from a different angle, try to attract different eyes to it. I know I am not the target audience for this, even if the show was good, like Loki was supposedly good, um, Wonder Woman, not Wonder Woman, Scarlet Witch, what was it? WandaVision was supposedly good, but I'm just tired of Marvel. I, I watched Thor Ragnar because I really liked the Thor series. I didn't really like it too much. I I just It's just not for me, really. I'm not the Marvel MCU type of person that these people are looking for. I don't want to buy any merchandise for this. It's mostly for kids, I think, and some fans, adults, want to take their kids to see this stuff, but... Does this show actually appeal to the sort of woman that my friend, my strong independent woman friend was telling me about who rages about patriarchy while running a business that she inherited from her father and co-ran with her once male partner? The sort of woman that may think that these men in their lives, men that they know and men all around and others did not help as much as they would for fellow men, so have some sort of spite and then they think, if it wasn't for patriarchy, then I wouldn't need help. I'd be like the men who don't need help and instead help others. And regardless, if the men do help, it's for all the wrong reasons. There is some acknowledgement of this when the fourth wall breaking She-Hulk in the character and in the comics breaks the fourth wall. I heard someone say oh, this is the first time a character has broken the fourth, the fourth wall. And again, this goes back to the whole, do these people actually know the comic books? Do they watch <laughs> comic book movies? Because this has been a thing that Deadpool did, but I think... I think She-Hulk is older than Deadpool, if I'm not mistaken. I think Deadpool was created in the 90s or something. But he's done it in, I guess that's Sony Universe. That's not necessarily Marvel Cinematic Universe. So you can see, yes, it's the first time in the Marvel Cinematic Universe the character has broken the fourth wall. But anyway, so the breaking the fourth wall thing. She-Hulk, the character, Jennifer Maz Jennifer Waters, Jennifer Maz I was going to say. Jennifer Waters expresses consternation at being hired for being a Hulk rather than her competence as a lawyer. I'd argue that it was her being a lawyer and having power rather than for her powers, regardless of how good she was at being a lawyer. But this is totally not projection by somewhat affirmatively actioned hired writers speaking on their own lived experience of being hired or hiring people based on happenstance features rather than competence. This surely no more than 1% of the population that the writers, Maslany, and other commentaries that think of men as emotionless or slaves to emotions surely can't be a part of, don't realize the effect of things like man up. This cohort also seem unable to understand what it means when people advocate for men to be more open about their feelings. Unable to take that evidence and form convincing arguments of the humanity of men, they then struggle to acknowledge that these are signs of how, rather than not having feelings, struggles, and other stressors, men tend to bottle them up. Now, nah, I'm just over here mansplaining away the seething anger I have for my toxic masculinity being exposed by words that I wish I had some Hulk-like power to lash out physically, kind of sort of like She-Hulk did to words that she didn't like. That's it for this time. Thank you all guys, gals, and everybody else in between for listening. I'm going to finish off with the Soul 3, and that's at what cost, at what cost would it be to actually have this story be just focusing on trolling the men, trolling the toxic fanboys out there? You're losing the chance of actually making a pretty good story and spending millions and millions of dollars doing it. Next is what solid proof do we have that this is what they were doing or that the critics are actually just review bombing? I don't think we have too much solid proof of that. Last question will be compared to what and I will apply that to that initial paragraph that Jennifer Walters' character said to Bruce Banner's Hulk. This is to Jennifer Walters, to the writers, to the people commenting and saying yes queen to it. What are they comparing to? Are they comparing to actual knowledge of Bruce Banner's life in MCU before he became the Hulk, what happened to him as the Hulk? I don't know, but I do know you can find links to the merchandise store where you can help me out. You can find those three questions on a shirt and ask those about other things in life. It's helped me out, might help you out, and thank you all very much. You can help me out by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Goodbye.